Hello, Eves. Oh, nice to see you here. And Jeremy. We have two people to start. How are you guys doing? Hello. <laughs> Hi. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, you soundproof your I, room. I, I don't hear you yet, uh, Adam. Oh, I might be. Do you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Um, yeah, I just check. Hello, oh, okay, I, I will check your sound because I think I yeah, have okay. everything. That was on my side, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm not at home uh, today. Oh, okay, but it looks like you have a proper soundproofing on the wall. Oh, this, yeah, this is my my brother's place who is a musician. So yes, this ah. is um, he's, uh, recording. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so uh, for doing this. This is really fun. Every time you. Um, join the meetup. It's very informative, and I think a lot of people look forward to seeing what you're up to. Um, you yeah. came to me with an interesting problem a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago maybe. And yeah. I think it's uh, evolved into some really interesting work and uh, an incredibly simplified solution. So I think a lot of people are very eager yeah. to see what you've done. Yes, the, 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 the idea is that uh, it's still a kind of a work in progress, but uh, I really want uh, people to, to know uh, first uh, about this work because I think it's... Uh, I, I didn't expect to, to, to go in this direction when uh, starting my work on uh, functional event sourcing. Uh, but it just uh, by some... Uh, sideways uh, fall into shape. And, uh, and so maybe talking about it uh, can give some idea to people who already have seen some of these structures and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I see that's really exciting. Yeah, uh, maybe, I mean, uh, it, it, yeah. I think a lot of people um, are joining for the first time. So I think we might, yeah. uh, it might be a good idea to, uh, to have a, I know it's boring for you to do this, <laughs> but to give a yeah, background yeah, on, you know, why you're yeah. into f functional programming, you know, yeah. how you how yeah. how you got into it, your history a little bit. <laughs> I, I I will do 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 that uh, for sure, and uh, of course, I, I, uh, today I I will not uh, talk much about the modeling. Yeah, of, that's fine. Uh, functional event sourcing and. Um, and uh, actually, the, the, the structure of the thing is uh, mostly inspired by what you've done uh, for event modeling. Uh, oh, because okay. uh, un until, um, until uh, la last year, when we first discussed about, uh, about it, uh, my vision of uh, modeling was more um, um, uh, abstract and uh, blurry. Mm -hmm. And uh, you really came with a with a model which is uh, very interesting to get only a few um, uh, basic components that mm -hmm. you can combine together, and uh, it clicked that uh, we could uh, take the model that you create with event modeling, and uh what what I wanted to 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 find is a way to to take these models. And to implement them, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, so uh, there is, of course, all this very interesting part in discovering the the model and uh, apply it. But something that is very interesting with um, the work. Hello, everybody who is joining uh, progressively. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the the really interesting part uh, in what I found is that um, actually, uh, once you can express. Uh, the domain uh, under the form of uh, generic uh, function signatures. Yeah. Um, uh, you can run them without knowing anything about what's happening inside the function. Right. Okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, so that's, that's uh, kind of just for people's background. That was the one of the goals of event modeling, which we're talking yeah. about here was to 
find the right anchor points on the events and we add uh, you 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 don't know but if they are combined this way it's this pattern or if you combine them this way you have these patterns this, this is something interesting yeah and yeah, yeah. Uh, and something uh, we get uh, going through to functional programming and mm -hmm. uh, I, I will show it more uh, explicitly when uh, I think in a few minutes, we'll, once uh, everybody will have joined, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, when you have um, generic function signatures, okay, you create functions that manipulate types you know nothing about. Yes. So yep. the only thing you can do is pass them or combine them or thing like that with functions that you don't know what what they do. And so you have a form of um, of uh, encapsulation by genericity, okay. If you have a list of T and you know nothing about T, the only thing that you can do is use it and pass it to functions and return it. Uh, yeah. You can yeah. do more than that. And um, uh, what, what I quickly found is that um, uh, I've been studying the, the, the model of, uh, of functional event sourcing since uh, Greg's presentation in 2012 mm -hmm. at uh, Domain Driven Design Exchange in London. Uh, which was about functional uh, event sourcing. Uh, the fact that uh, you could see the state as a fold of event, of the on list of event. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that was the first step. And then I tried to play with the idea in, uh, uh, in a lot of ways, in, mostly in F-sharp. And uh, uh, something that was uh, a realization uh, recently is that uh, it's a very good pattern to do event sourcing, but you can also do it to model a classical load state, safe state process, okay? Yeah. And actually that uh, there is an isomorphism between both. So uh, you can take any computing that is, uh, I, I, yeah, from that I will show, uh, I will draw the thing uh, after that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is an automatic way to take a system that is not uh, event sourced and create an event source system that will be not necessarily a good way to event source, but you can take any system that is just a bit mistake and change it to a system that uh, return a list of things that you can fold on first. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, what I found that is was also interesting uh, is that when you have a system written like that, uh, you can also load on safe state and it's okay, but you're ready to do event sourcing if you want. Yeah. Okay? So it's not because uh, you wrote it in a way that could be event source that you will actually use infrastructure of event sourcing to run it, okay? Uh, the other thing is that I, I finally, uh, last week, uh, discussing with you on Robert Bart Bartolink, who uh, I don't know if he's uh, around, but uh, I really want to, to thank him for thank him to, for taking time to discuss also about the subject. Uh, I finally found the, the discrepancy between your model of uh, process uh, manager and uh, the one that I've seen elsewhere. And I finally found that the main difference was the, that in some cases, uh, the, when, when you were using the event store, uh, events were totally sorted, totally ordered. Yeah. And uh, in some other cases where you use uh, different stores, it's not the case. And uh, there was something that uh, uh, in, when uh, all events are totally sorted, you don't have to make a duplicate of events to keep the order. And when it's not totally sorted, you have to do. And so um, I finally found a shape uh, for processes that can be used in both contexts, uh, which is cool. Yeah, I was uh, I was quite impressed how clean it came out. So I had a, just so everyone knows, I had a, <laughs> the benefit of, of seeing this earlier. Yeah. With a, uh, we met before the last meetup. So um, before the last meetup, um, if people joined early, they might have been able to saw, to see <laughs> yeah. a little bit of the code. So I, I have a little bit of knowledge about this beforehand. So I um, think yeah. you'll be really excited to see just how clean things can be, especially in, in F Sharp. Yeah, and on the other thing, and this is what I will uh, uh, 
talk uh, today is that I, I've been working uh, recently on, um, on a, um, a way to abstract, uh, no, no, not to abstract, but uh, to, to compose calls to a service uh, that can make diffs, differences uh, of uh, planning. So you, you, you send them uh, a value over time uh, for keys. Okay, so you have keys that have values that change over time. And the thing is that you want uh, to gather values you get from one source and then uh, for each of the keys, uh, gather the data, send it, send it to, the, to a service that will defeat against current value and return you just the difference, okay? And uh, the problem is that uh, managing the keys, managing the difference, managing all that was um, uh, kind of difficult. And uh, at some point I found that it was a kind of structure that looked like a uh, functor, yep. uh, which is uh, a new, I, I could use in one way, something that looked like um, uh, applicatives, applicative functors. Uh, to combine things into a bigger structure. And on the other side, it was both covariant and contravariant. I will explain all this. And yeah, I will need to... an explanation of covariant. Exactly. And contravariant. I will show on it. <laughs> Actually, not very complicated. So yeah. you, you will just follow me after that. But mm -hmm. I, I, but this, this work um, uh, was an entry in this uh, area to compose things uh, in bidirectional programming. So the, the idea of bidirectional uh, programming is that, uh, for instance, you, you, you want to, to have a, a serializer on a deserializer, okay? And uh, a serializer is something that uh, takes some text and will uh, return you uh, T, something of type C, mm -hmm. and the serializer will take something of type T and return um, some, uh, some text, okay? Mm -hmm. And the thing is that um, there is a good way to compose uh, serializer together, okay? Uh, so if you have a serializer for something and a serializer for another thing, there are good operations to combine them together to get a combizer, uh, serializer for the combination of those, those things, okay? And in the other way, there are also structures to, to um, uh, text deserializer for small parts and taking some uh, text that is a combination of those parts and combine the small serializer into a uh, deserializer into a bigger deserializer that can um, deserialize the combination of those things and give you the result, okay? Yeah. And the thing is that uh, there is um, uh, some construct for one, construct for the other, but when you do bidirectional uh, programming, what you want is to use the same operators to create both at the same times. So uh, you will write only uh, how these things uh, shape together, and it will give you both a serializer and a deserializer uh, in the end, okay? Yeah, makes sense. And uh, the thing is that uh, it has a structure and I recognize this structure inside my functional event sourcing uh, design. And so I try to play with that, okay? Right. And the thing is that uh, it worked. So this is why I, I will show now, okay? I know everyone's like waiting with, with bated yeah. breath so, to see the code. <laughs> uh, let's, let, let's start. So for, for a quick recap, I will first explain what uh, I- Yeah, the, I, maybe the I, game, I, what you're doing, right? So yeah. So, oh wait, uh, and I'm, your background too. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, um, I'm working at the DH uh, Hospitality uh, as, a, as an architect. Okay, my name is Jeremy Chassin. So the, the company I'm working for is um, DH and we do software for the hotel business. Uh, but I have a long uh, history with uh, messing around with code and uh, having fun for doing uh, functional programming, uh, music, graphics, and all that with programming. And um, uh, for, for my uh, activity at DH uh, all more than 10 years ago, I met uh, Greg Young, and um, I really felt that uh, all this thing about uh, 
uh, domain driven design, but also events, event sourcing, and all that was an uh, important part of the, the thing. And it kept uh, me looking for even better way to to understand it and uh, write it and all that. So I've I've been uh, working on a book for the last two years. Yeah, but uh, it will be ready eventually. Um, on this, but on, on, on the way, I'm finding new new insights, so I share it with you. And uh, so the, the the idea of event sourcing, everybody, in, I think here probably knows that event sourcing is usually described as uh, uh, storing the events that happened instead of the current state. Uh, and I, I will take another uh, direction uh, that will lead. Uh, eventually to the same um, conclusion. But uh, what I say is that when, when you have a system that is uh, stateful, uh, so I don't know, maybe you don't see my screen yet. I have to, to share my screen. Okay. Uh, share screen one. Okay, and I will just move the window. Uh, not this one. I think everyone one. can see that. If, uh, uh, if anyone I, I, has I problems will. with the font size, I think you have it set up properly, so it looks good. Yeah, I, I just move uh, the view uh, on the other screen. I don't know how to, to make it bigger. Yep. Ah, this is the thing I need to move. Uh, maybe I need to uh, exit full screen. Where is it? Uh, cha -cha -cha -cha. No. Ah, yes, on the other screen. Better. And okay, so I see approximately people. So, the, do you see? Do you see the the white uh, window? Yeah. Okay. When I draw, you can see it. Perfect. Oh yeah. So, uh, the idea is that when when you have a stateful system. Um, uh, you want to act on it, and for this, we will model it as a command. Okay, uh, so this is information that the system doesn't know and an intention of uh, on what you, you want to do. Okay, and things will happen and uh, we will model this thing as events. Okay, but the thing is that if I just draw that, uh, this system is stateless um, if uh, I don't add something because if we, we consider here that we have a pure function, uh, events uh, on the outside can depend only on the command on the inside and nothing else. So, uh, for for to 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 get a, to make different decision in time for the same command, uh, we sometimes want to do something different. For instance, we have done something too much, and no, we don't want to reject it. We have to, to, to have a state that will contain information about what happened before. And so we'll just uh, put some state in here. So here we have a function that takes a command on the state and will return some events. So it's a list of uh, events. And uh, this function, we will call it decide. Uh, it says that when you are in this state and you are uh, asked to do this command, uh, this is what happens, okay? Uh, of course, the state will have to change over time and it will change based on just what happens. So uh, what we will do is create another function which we will call evolve that will take one event on one state and return a new state, okay? This way. And so uh, when, when we receive a command on the state, we can decide, get a list of events, and we will call evolve with the first event and the current state, the same one here, mm -hmm. and uh, return a new state. And this way, we'll, we'll be uh, ready to take the next command and uh, loop again, OK? The only thing that is missing in this picture <coughs> is that when, when we receive our first command before anything happened, uh, we have no state, and for this, we will create an initial state that will uh, uh, be used as a bootstrap for the thing, okay? Uh, at, at this point, I'm not talking about the scope of this. 
Um, yeah, this is this so is quite a familiar. If everyone's been doing, anyone that's been doing event sourcing will will follow this pattern because I think there's some early steps that people take when they're looking at event sourcing that's that skip that uh, events to state approach. They yeah kind of so, muddle so the two together a little bit. Yeah, exactly. The the pro the yeah, there there are there are two two main uh, uh, things um, when when you don't uh, se uh, separate things. The first thing is that uh, here it's functional, so uh, decide on evolve the decide on evolve function are pure, so uh, their output depends only on the value in on the input, and they produce no other effect that returning the value. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's uh, quite classical in functional language, less in uh, other languages. But when, when you do uh, this in uh, um, the, the way you write it, uh, usually uh, in, in an object-oriented setting, is that you will mutate states. So uh, mutating state is a bit like having the apply method that will take an event on the state and mutate the state that will be ready for the next decide. OK? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the thing we call usually replay is just taking the event and calling evolve a lot of time to get the new state. Okay, so yeah, and, and a lot of people save that state as well. They persist the state to help. Yeah. So so uh, in in the thing that you we can see is sometimes uh, for 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 a system where we don't uh, separate events and state. Okay. So in a system that you don't write this way, you will have something like I have a command. And I have a state, and I will update this state. So in a way, we can say that it's uh, we output a new state that we will feed, and here we will have a reaction we will call outside service, something like that. But instead of uh, directly do it, we could uh, return a, a list of it, okay, and then map this list to actions, okay. So usually people write things a bit more like that, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, but a way we can, uh, so uh, what is the link between both? The thing is that we could uh, remove this, okay, and happen to the list uh, update state, like that, okay, and then here we could take this list of events and put it here, and we could say if it's a classical event, uh, I do nothing, uh, but if it's an update state, I return the state, okay. And actually, you find again the, the schema you have above. Yes. So uh, you, you you can do both. Uh, so let let's see what what we need to 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 make this schema. We need a, a common type that is a type uh, that contains uh, values for each command. So you can have a play card event, a play card command. Uh, uh, start game command and uh, pass uh, my turn uh, command. Okay, and they are part so of. So you're the, talking about the... a game now, right? So maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is to to give a, a more concrete uh, example. Yes. Uh, the other thing that we will need is uh, an event type. So an event type is uh, some things that happen in the game. So for example, a card was played, uh, the game was uh, is o just uh, is over, and thing like that. Okay, so. The commands are in the present and imperative tense, while event are usually expressed as a, as a past tense. But actually, at this point, this is semantic we give, but uh, we will not go further into this interpretation. This is just to make a link between what you will code and what you will try to put inside. OK? Yeah. Uh, the other thing is a state, right? Uh, so your, this is your current state, and this is a, a t type that can represent all your states valid. Uh, if it can represent only valid state, it's better. If it can represent more, but you constrain your code so that it doesn't reach your state, it's OK. OK? Yeah. And then we, we have a, a decide function that takes a command, that takes a state, and will return a list of events. Like that, okay, and it says when I'm uh, you ask me to do this and I'm in this state, here is what happens. If nothing happens, you can return an empty list. If one thing happens, you return a single event. If multiple yep. things happen, you can return uh, multiple events. 
and then we have uh, the, the evolved function. that say, when I'm in this state and this happened, here is my new state. Okay. And the last thing is the initial state. It's almost the last thing, but uh, I will uh, expand uh, just after. Initial state, which is a state. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for instance, if you have a counter that cannot uh, exceed uh, 10, uh, your initial state can be zero. And uh, each time uh, you're asked to go up uh, to increase, uh, it will say increased, except that once you reach 10, it will say nothing. And then uh, Evolve will say that when you have uh, your current value and increased, uh, you will return the current value plus one and you're done. Okay, mm -hmm. really easy. Of course, you can have also a big financial domain uh, backed uh, behind this function. And actually they will have the same shape. Yeah. They yeah, old card game. Uh, just you ask it to do things, it says what happened, and then it's, uh, it's, put, it's um, able to, to remember the things by folding them into a state and uh, doing. So folding uh, is something that people in regular programming don't know the terminology of. And yeah, it's... so uh, there, there is uh, multiple term terminology for this. So there is fold, but uh, people coming from C sharp could know better the things which is called aggregate. So you do something like you have a list mm -hmm. of events, and then you do an aggregate. Mm -hmm. And then you need a list that takes first an accumulator and this accumulator will be your state, okay? Yeah. And then it will take uh, things from the list, yes. which is events, cool. And so you can just pass evolve. And the thing is that uh, it will be called each time uh, with a new event and the previous aggregate value and return a new value and start again. So uh, here, the initial, the starting point for a state is initial state. Yeah. And then you're done. So this thing uh, is taking a list of event, is taking the evolve function on the initial state and will iteratively call evolve to get the next state uh, based on the next event and once again and once again. And in the end, we get the current state. Yeah, and people that are not in C sharp and have uh, something like PHP, this would be, you know, es essentially um, iterating over your events. Yeah, yeah, you can do something like uh, something every time. Yeah, state equal uh, initial state, and then you will do uh, for each uh, for each uh, e in uh, events. And then you will do just a state is equal to, uh, or assign to uh, in this way, uh, evolve of uh, state and the event. Okay. And in the end, state is equal to the current state. Yeah, so, exactly. So you'll yeah. see how all of this syntax, I'm kind of spoiling things here, but how this yeah. wordy you, syntax, usually, how short it is in, in, a, <laughs> in a functional uh, in a uh, language, you will uh, write fold evolve uh, initial state uh, and events. Yeah. And you're good. Uh, so it will uh, call uh, the evolve function for each event uh, folding uh, over initial state. And in the end, you get uh, the current state. So uh, that, that's already an interesting result. Uh, and this is very useful when you save uh, events, okay? Because the things that you can do, for instance, to run this thing, uh, so I go back to the schema, is that uh, in the beginning, you have no state, so you start with initial state, you receive a command, you pass the command of the state to the decide function, you get a list of events and you save them, okay? Yeah. And then, uh, when, when you, and you can just finish here. And when you want to start again, what you can do is say, give me all the events, uh, use the evolve function to get the current state, pass this state to the command, decide and return the new events and save them after the previous one. And when you will be called again, you can do it again, okay? Something you can do, which will be more efficient uh, is to keep the state uh, around in memory, for instance. And so you start with the initial state, you save the events, but when you, you, you once you have saved the events, you fold them to get the new state. 
and you're ready to take the next command. So uh, here you don't need to reload. You can just take this state and the command, uh, decide to get new events that you will happen to the end of the stream, for them to get a new state and you're ready again to get the next command. So you have, don't have this load, uh, save load uh, that you have in most uh, enterprise application. Yeah. That, that said, this is a pattern people are, are used to, uh, which is uh, not that bad, or I mean, people manage to, to run system like that and a lot of people are, are familiar with it. Mm -hmm. So we can run the same way. So uh, when we receive the first command, we, we try to load state, but there is no state. So we take the initial state and we call the decide function and we get a bunch of events, okay? Mm -hmm. Instead of saving these events, what we do is that we fold this event with the, the initial state and we get the current state and we save it, okay? Yeah. And on the, on the next call, we can just reload the state, take the command, we get a bunch of events, we fold them, we get the current state, we save it and we can do it again, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's also compatible with, with this way of working. What, what thing you can do anyway is that uh, aside from saving the state, you can still save the events so that you have both the state and the history. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the events will be viewed more like a log, but a log that contains all the information that you need to rebuild your state anyway. So if at some point you have a problem with your state, you can still rebuild it from the list of events. But operationally, you can decide to not use the event, um, the, the event log mm -hmm. to, to reload the state, just reload it. And yeah. after that, if you have uh, performance, uh, you, 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 get, you get into performance limit, you can uh, decide to finally uh, not reload state each time, but keep it in memory and just have an event and uh, on a reboot, uh, load the state on the few events that happened afterward and things like that. This is called uh, snapshotting and all that. But um, it's totally uh, compatible with uh, this vision uh, and this expression of the problem, okay? So uh, at some point, I continue with my story. I found that this thing looks a lot like what is called in uh, domain-driven design aggregate, okay? Yeah. This word that people don't use but don't really like usually because... Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it ties event sourcing to domain-driven design. So in the yeah. modeling, we do it with uh, just uh, swim lanes. Stream. Yeah, a, stream, swim lane, a, a yes. swim lane, you put them all in the yeah. same row. And uh, the, the thing is that uh, the aggregate word says that what is inside has to be consistent. And we see that it's very easy to run this in a consistent way. And actually, this is the idea. You, you take your decision only based on the output of your own previous decision. This is the only thing that can influence your current state. Yeah. Uh, previous things that happened to you and uh, what you're requested to, to do. This is yeah. the isolation level that is uh, 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 described in the aggregate pattern. Yeah, it's for uh, it's for consistency, so you can always depend on it. It's you know pure functions and functional programming. All those yeah. things usually go hand in hand, so that uh, yeah. you all you know given those events, you will always get the next decision to be exactly the same. There's no outside yeah. influence, no side yeah. effects. And, and Exactly. So here, here you, you, your, your, your decision cannot be based on something that is outside the schema. That's right. That's also systems by, thinking. By definition, right? there is no way that. So yeah. um, <laughs> it kind of enforces the rule of aggregate. Okay. Um, and uh, the question is, does any aggregate can be modeled as this? Mm -hmm. Okay. And in a way, just uh, this schema says that actually, yes. This one, where we yeah. get from something that is not written as event sourcing, but we actually can make it uh, take the same um, the same shape. So yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, any system that is isolated will be able to re uh, be written in this way, and so uh, we can convert this way to uh, the other way. This one. And mm -hmm. so, uh, <laughs> if you have something that is isolated enough, you can use this shape. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we could say that this is an aggregate, but still, uh, I didn't like it too, that much because aggregate is not very easy to get the point. 
yeah the, the, the terminology is difficult for yeah. people there's all these lexicons to you know to learn and master so, so the, the <laughs> we question struggle then, every day with that <laughs> yeah the, the question then was what name to give to this structure mm -hmm. okay and what is the essence of this the the idea is that um when, when you have uh, a decide function you 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 see that you have uh, three three types inside the for the for this thing yeah we have yeah. the command the event and the state okay but when when you have uh when when you look at the at the decide function it takes a state and return a list of events okay yeah um Actually, the thing is that if we say, what is this thing? This thing is a, a, a fold using the, the, the evolve function yep. of uh, the list of past events. Okay. What, what information do you have as a result of a fold of a list of events? You exactly. have always, at most, as much information as in the original list. Yes. Okay. So the maximum form of the state is a list of events. That's right. Of all the events from the beginning. That's right. Okay. So you can always say that no, it's not state. Your state is actually a list of events. That's right. Okay. So how does it behave? Now you have a decide function that takes a comment on the list of events, which is the history. Okay. Exactly. And it will return the change, the new things that to happen at the end of the history. And so the evolve function is taking a state, which will be actually a list of events, and the right. event, and the result will be a list of events, just the list where you yeah. happen the last event to the list. Okay. Yeah. And the initial state will be empty uh, events. The empty list yeah. of events. Okay, which is always an initial state. So once you look at this, state disappears. So you have two things. You have a trivial uh, evolve function, so we can forget it. We have a trivial initial state, we can forget it. And the only thing that remains is a decide function. Exactly. So this thing, this thing is actually just a decider. A decider is a better name than an aggregate. Yeah, I, I think so. And the thing is that also more formal because um, uh, an aggregate says that, um, I, I think the blurry interpretation of the aggregate is interesting. It just talk about this boundary. That's uh, right. Here we have we have a structure, which is actually a ma ma mathematical structure, which is That's says right. we have types, we have function with types and things like that. So it's very structuring in the way, um, in the way that we, we get to the, to the point, okay? Yeah. So, <clears throat> Uh, the thing is that now we have a decider, and this decider is uh, this thing I've shown uh, here. This is a, a sextuple, okay? We have mm -hmm. three types, two functions, and one value, mm -hmm. okay? I, I will add to this something because I w really want to, to uh, uh, ask people to add it. This is a East terminal. Uh, predicate that takes a state and return a bool and check that if we are in a terminal state. The idea is that every everything should have an end. And this is uh, telling you when you reach the end and you can either archive or get rid of the thing. Okay. Yeah. This way, if, if you don't have a is terminal uh, predicate, it means that potentially it can run forever and you will have operational problems. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's been uh, more and more of a challenge the longer that event sourcing has been around. <laughs> yeah. Because exactly. more and more of these systems have been running so, for a long time. <laughs> I will say you, you have to provide this function to say, I know what it, when it finish. And you are enforced in the structure to say, this is my limit when it ends. OK? Mm -hmm. And this is interesting because after that, it makes operation simpler. When you have something that is terminal, you can uh, either uh, delete the stream or uh, delete the object or archiving to a cold storage or uh, mark it with something that will uh, make it able to garbage collect after uh, uh, sometimes or something like that. Okay, so this is 
a bit less into, uh, important, but still I would put it in the decider, okay? Yeah. So here we have a decider. And the decider is this uh, six things to, uh, that have this shape together. together. Uh, similarly, we, we have uh, something that is process or process manager. And that have a similar structure. I will not explain all the thing I'm writing about a book about it and all that. But globally, for a process, you have almost the same thing. You have uh, action result. Uh, this is kind of the same as the events that you get uh, on the from the the deciders. But the thing is that an action result is a, a combination of uh, events that can happen to different places. Okay, so they don't come from a single aggregate or, or a single decider. They can combine several things. So. Um, here, this is not the same type as the E that you have in on the other part, okay? This has another shape from the event. It can always be derived from the event from all the other deciders, but it's different. And it will take a state and it will return a, a list of events. And uh, then you have, uh, so this is a ingest. And then you have an evolve function, and the evolve function is taking a state on an event and returning a state. And the thing is that, as you describe uh, in event modeling, this state will be a to-do list, a list of things to do. Okay. Yeah. And and then I will have two functions or one function, and there are this is a, there is an, an automatic transcription between the version with two functions or only one. So. It depends on your language and things like that, how you prefer to implement it. They are isomorphic, okay? Uh, the idea is, is that uh, there is a first one, which is a React, okay? Which take a state on an event and which will uh, return a list of actions, okay? And this one say, when I'm, uh, this to-do list is here and this just happened, this is the few actions that should start now, okay? And the other yeah. one is uh, 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 pending, which is taking a state and returning a list of action. And this is a list of all the actions that should be underway currently. Okay. So uh, when when you are in a reactive uh, setup and you don't want to abuse uh, uh, retrying the same action multiple times, it's better to use this one. But when you had the uh, art failure and everything crashed and you don't know what is currently underway, you will have to resort to this one anyway to get the full list of action, okay? Uh, this yeah. one, the React is just a kind of filter on the pending based on the current event, okay? This is not more than this. So another way to group these two things is to say that you have a state on an optional event, which is the context, and that will return a list of actions. So if you have an event, you can restrict the list of uh, action to, to do. And if you have no events as a current context, you will return the full list. OK? Yeah, makes sense. And then action can be mapped to comments to other uh, deciders. OK? So uh, you can map uh, deciders events to action result. You can map uh, action to, to uh, comments, and then you can run all this together. The other part is views, but views are easy. Uh, oh, yes, you also have, um, uh, for the process manager, you also have uh, East Terminal to check when the process is over and which is a state bool uh, like that. And there is also an initial state. Yeah. Uh, which is, <clears throat> so, um, yeah. And then you have views, uh, and the views uh, are just uh, state, uh, event uh, state, and which is an evolve function on an initial state. Uh, S. Cool. Uh, so of course here the event can be also like a action result, um, uh, something that is gathered from multiple uh, sources. 
And so each of the each uh, type are different and then you will need mappings from one to the other and things like that, okay? Yeah. Uh, so that's the global view of the parts. But then the problem is, then my problem was I, I wanted to, to, to model the, the crazy eight game, okay? Yep. And uh, in the Crazy 8 game, we have several parts. We have the, the game pile where people put the card, like uh, a four of diamond. Okay. And then another player will play on it, a uh, five of diamond. Cool. Mm -hmm. And people play here. And here, the, real, the, the rules are applied and they are strict. Okay. And uh, around the table, there are players. And the player have card in hand, like that. And there is a stockpile that contains all the cards that are not in the game or in hand. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so to start the game, you shuffle the stockpile, and uh, then a player will draw some ends, and then they will start. Uh, we will draw a first card that will be put on the table, and then we will uh, play uh, uh, each player uh, at their turn, and uh, they will play some cards. Uh, yep. We we can do. We could do a big decider around all that. Uh, right. Where the command would be player uh, play this card and then it will be removed from their ends. On when it's their turn, uh, we will move. Uh, card from the stockpile to players end and all that, and we will have all the comments coming here, okay, and events about what's happening. I would put air there, and the state is this thing that will be folded uh, inside, okay. So players say, I know my end. I want to play this card, and we will check the rule: is it possible or not? And if it's the case, it will be removed from their end and all that, okay. We can we we could we could write. All those things together, okay. Uh, exactly. But, but the thing is that when when you look at it, uh, what's happening here, and what's happening here, uh, can be easily modeled differently. Here, yeah, the yeah. action are shuffle, and the action is that it's shuffled, okay. And uh, you can draw a hand, and it will uh, draw five cards, or you can draw a penalty. And it will draw two cards, or you can draw a pass, and it will take one card from one player. Okay. Yeah. And here, modeling this action is very easy. You say shuffle, and it will say it's shuffled, and the new, um, the new, you start with the initial state of all the cards uh, in uh, sorted. And when you say shuff shuffle, it will return a um, uh, non-shuffled non, non uh, shuffle, uh, version of the, of the cards and you can make your new state based on this shuffle. And uh, when you draw, it will remove the first card and all that, okay? So it's very easy to model. For a card end, you can either uh, take cards from there or uh, pick cards to play them, okay? And here, this is the same action, okay? So you yep. can take cards and play. So it would be really easy to model a hand, like take cards or pick a card to play it. Yep. Okay. So wh where do I put my binary here? Or do I do small things with process that ensure that when cards are drawn from, the, um, from this, they are going here? OK. I, I mean, uh, both are doable. But no, today, I think running one stream for all this and having only one thing for one game seems good enough to run the thing okay right but uh, start to imagine that you have uh, millions of games together and player is not in the same part of the world and all things like that maybe this player would be better served on a server on the other side of the planet and we will we would stream the event there for the process to happen that would yeah. be cool but then if I start to split those things, I will have some kind of micro services for players and micro services for the stockpile and micro services for the for the game, mm -hmm. and everything could be distributed. So maybe kind of actors distributing actors for all parts and things like that. It seems a bit overkill to start with this. 
Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, yeah, okay, maybe it's overkill, but um, if I do the modeling one way, it's not done the other way. And uh, if I start to split things, they, I will have to run them in isolation and independently. Okay, so right. uh, I have the choice of a better model, more independent model, but more uh, infrastructural on, uh, on the runtime complexity or a more chunky model. Yeah. And uh, that I maybe I will uh, one day uh, find the limit of this model and then get into trouble when I need more distribution. Yeah. Okay. So what is the right limit between both? Okay. Yeah, this is where your the coordination between these things becomes a important. Yeah, focus. because because uh, when when you do event modeling, you know that uh, you can uh, see that this thing could have its own streamline. That's okay? right. But is this because it has that you should run it this way? Maybe not. Maybe operationally, it's, it's simpler to run everything in kind of streamlines that would be. Yeah, exactly. Everything just way, has, every in, event just has a, the game ID and that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So you, you could take all the things with the game ID and it would be similar. Yeah. So uh, I was thinking with, uh, about that. And at some point I, I, I realized that. Let's say we have a decider X. And this decider X uh, is a decider. So it takes command X, it takes event X, it has a state X, it has a decide function X that takes a CX and, e, uh, and SX yep. and return EX and all that, and then evolve X and uh, initial state. Uh, X and also the other um, is terminal, but uh, it's, it will be easy to, to get. We have another decider. Y, CY, EY, SY, decide Y, evolve Y, and initial state Y. Can I make a single decider XY? Uh, that would be that yeah. would be awesome, and actually yeah. it's easy. It's easy. So the thing is that we will have a command C that will be either C X or C Y. Yep. Okay, and the event will be what E X or E Y, mm -hmm. and the state will be. It will be not either S X or S Y. It will be the combination of both. So it will be S X and S Y. The tuple or a pair. Yeah. Okay. So the state of the those both thing is the pair of the state of the parts. Okay. So that's cool because now we have the three first uh, components. The question is uh, decide x. Uh, decide how it will be written. Uh, so we we can do something like uh, if it's cx. And we will call, if in this case, we will call this CX value a C, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, what we do is that we will do a decide X, which is a function that will be able to take this C, which is of type CX, okay? Yeah. And uh, it will also take a state, but the state, which part will, uh, will it be? So uh, here we have this, uh, this, and we also have SX and SY. Yeah, pair. you just take it one We will part. use only the left part yeah. of it, okay? And this will return us a list of EX events. So what we will do is that we will uh, map these events uh, to the E type, this one, by saying, oh, yes, it's the it's EX events of the, this is the EX part of the events, okay? Yeah. So the thing at the end here is a list of events of type E, okay? But if it's a CY, I will do the same thing, but on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so here, my uh, decide function is taking a C on a S and return a list of E. Right, this is a decide function that is uh, okay. 
and it will either when you have a comment that is for the first one will return a list of events for the from the first one and when you have a comment for the second one will go to the decision of the second one and will return a, a list of events of the second one but we have unified both type as a, either was the one from the first type or the one from the other type so they are all of this common type okay yeah the evolve function uh, is taking a state which is I, uh, the pair of sx and sy and is taking uh, e and so if this is ex and we recall e we'll say evolve and with uh, the state for uh, evolve x uh, and we will take the x part of the state and we will give the event which is actually in evolve for x and we will put it as the left part of our result but we will just copy the y state which didn't change in the operation yeah okay and for the other one we'll just do the reverse we will return the state for the left part uh, unchanged and evolve with y the state on the right with this event mm -hmm. okay the initial state oh is that an sx or an xy sy yeah it's just initial state for x and initial state for y okay and now i just created the decider which has still exactly the same structure as both of the other, except that it can take comments for both and it will re uh, return event for both and maintain state for both. Yeah. Okay. So what I can do here is, for instance, I can take my game on my stock pile and create a single decider here. Yeah. But I can still write both independently mm -hmm. and then combine them. Okay. So no, I can create a, a single thing for both. The question is then for players, because the problem is that players, we don't know exactly how much players we have and it will depend. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can we use this structure to combine them? It's a bit more complicated. So what thing we can do is that we can say, okay, I have a decider uh, X, which is uh, X, uh, no, we will call it a decider and it will be uh, E, uh, C, E, S, decide, evolve, an initial state. The problem is that we want many of this. Okay. Yeah. What we will do is create a, a, a kind of, uh, the term is sequence, but we, we can, we will uh, call uh, it a two map and it will create we will give it the decider and it will uh, return a new decider that takes a key, okay, which is an identity yeah. and a command. It will take a key. Uh, for event, we will get the ID of the player on the event. And for the state, we will have a map of key and yeah, S. The state, yeah. Okay, and then uh, decide evolve on state. So how do we write this thing? So uh, decide, we'll take a key and a command and a state which will be a map, okay? A map of uh, player ID and uh, the state, okay? First thing we do is that we try find K in the, in the map. Yeah. If we find it, we find it. But if we don't find it, what we can do is we will default to initial state. So it's not in our map. So we never heard about it. So we are in initial state. We are ready to take the first command. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we have a state and we have a command. So we will call decide with this command. Okay. And we get a bunch of events. Uh, the problem is that these events are only for K, the player K, okay? So what we will do is that we will map it. And when we have an event, we will return K and the event. So now 
we return a pair of the player for which the command happened and the events that hap uh, happen to it. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this 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 is a decider for the types we showed uh, before. Uh, for evolve. What we do is that we have a state, which is a map, and an event, which will be actually uh, um, the ID of the player or the key, and uh, an event. So what we do is we try to find a K uh, in M. And if we don't find it, we can default to uh, initial state. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, this, is a, this is a state for the player. Okay, so now we can have a new state which will be a new state which will be evolve of the event of the state and uh, the event. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then here we, we can use the, the is terminal uh, predicate. So uh, if new state is terminal, we can remove the state from the map. Okay, or if it's not terminal, we can update the state in the map. That's the thing. Okay. But usually, what we will do is uh, make m um, add a key and a, a new state to the map. And so, this is our new state. The state is a map with the state for this player that has been updated to the new computed state. Okay. On the initial state, uh, it's just an empty map. And so I, I, I'm able this way to take a, the a decider for a single player mm -hmm. and create a decider for many players. Okay. So the idea is that uh, what we can do is we can uh, combine uh, things together. Uh, and so. Uh, for, for, for instance, here, uh, when I have this, so I, I can take my three uh, basic decider, which are uh, a decider for the game, a decider for uh, the stockpile, and the decider for one player. I can uh, use uh, two map to take the decider for one player to make a decider for n players, OK? And then I can take the three and combine them together to make a single decider. So. Uh, the command will have something like either, either it's a game command and it will go through this one or it will be a stockpile command and it will go to this one or it's a, uh, a hand command in which case we will have the player ID and something and it will go based on the player ID to the right player. Yeah. OK. But this thing is a single type of command. And all the events that will be received will be uh, something like game event. Yeah. Or stockpile event. Or, uh, or end uh, event with the player ID and the event. OK. So. Uh, I'm not even uh, in a position or where I have to put everything in the same stream because since I know what uh, is the target of each part, I can even put if uh, each of these events is there in their own streams. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, or I can also create a single stream with everything and then I will split. Uh, if I have to, to change it, I will be able to take a single stream create this uh, structure and then dispatch on different uh, channels the uh, different parts, OK? But uh, this is something that I can decide independently from my modeling, OK? Yep. And now I can decide to run this thing like that. Uh, the, the question is that at some point, I will have a lot of uh, pair of pair of union of union and things like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, because you you have some opinions there in terms of uh, the deck um, and, uh, you know, individual hands. So there's these relationships within that overall system that yeah. are that need to have special kind of mapping. So it's, it's interesting to see 
the support of higher level patterns that you can put in, but based on the finite state machine functional programming paradigm as the as your units. Yeah. Exactly, and on one of the good things is that you will model them uh, uh, independently, okay? But often what, what is happening is that you, you try to do independent things and then you will try to, to wire them together. But since it's ad hoc code, uh, maybe in some places you will use the output of one to put as an input on, of another or something like that. And so uh, they will not be independent anymore. Uh, yeah. due to the glue code between them to, to gather them, okay? Yeah. But here, we rely on operators, okay? And operators know nothing about what's inside, so they have no way of uh, messing, up, uh, messing up with the content of the function because <coughs> they don't know anything about this function. So the only thing that can do is glue them together, but without, without uh, adding any more uh, uh, connection. Okay. So uh, you know that if you, you combine these things using the operators, there is no way that you cannot split them again to run them independently. Yeah. Okay. Because the glue code uh, is never is always a stop code that you didn't write and that ensure uh, the isolation. So mm -hmm. it's safe to use it to glue things together, okay? So the question then is why, why uh, I was talking about uh, uh, functors and profunctors. Uh, let's go to the point because uh, here it, it <laughs> will be, because it gives a, another way to, to combine the, uh, the thing, okay? So the idea is that we have a decider, okay? And the decider is, the, is uh, generic on three types C, uh, e and S, okay? And the question is that if we take this constant, okay? And let's say we, I have a function that can convert uh, a C prime to C, okay? I can take the decider there, this function and create a decider of C prime. How do I do that? Quite easy. I take this decider. Uh, I take the, my decider like that, okay, and I take uh, f that is converting c to c prime to c, okay, and my decide yep. function becomes this decide is okay. And so it will take uh, a command which will be a c prime. Okay, because my type will be a supreme and it will take a state. And what, will be, what it will do is very simple. It will just use the decide function from the other one. Yeah. And instead of passing this, it will just pass the result of uh, the function where we pass supreme. The result will be a C. Okay, right. so it will be able to, to take it and we can use the state and we'll get a list of events. So uh, what you can so see is that if I have a function that takes another type of command and I'm able to convert this other type of command to the type of command of the decider, it can become a decider of this other type of command. Okay? That's right. So for instance, here, if you have a function that is taking a string, which is a JSON for uh, your, your uh, command. Yeah, it's serialized. Okay? Yeah. And that returns the unserialized version. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take a decider and get a decider that is able to take JSON text as an input. Right. Okay. For for instance. Yeah, one right? example could be something else, generalizer yeah. or something else like that. Yeah. Uh, actually, the way the, the reason I want to use it is that when you have uh, either command C X and command C Y, I would like to say. Uh, so I have a command of type C, which can be either uh, CX or CY. And I will create a function that take a C and we re will return a CX. But the problem is that when it's a CY, I don't have a result. Okay, so we will re return an optional uh, CX. Okay, so you give me a command that can be either a CX or a CY. Okay. 
and I have this function that take a C and will return a CX option. When it's a CX, it will return it. When it's a CY, it will return that it has no value. Okay. And now we can take a decider of CX, E and S. And the decide function uh, will take a CX uh, on the S and return the list of E. Okay. What I will say is that um, I will create a decide function that says that take a C, mm -hmm. which is not a CX, which could be. Okay. And I have this function that we will call F. Uh, I take a state. And what we will do is that we will uh, pass C to F and we are not sure that we will get a value. Okay. Is this value as a, is a CX? Okay. We can actually call the decide function with it uh, and with the state. And we will get a list of events uh, of type uh, E. If it's nothing, what can we do? We can return an empty list, which is also a list of events. Okay. Yeah. So here, what I do is that. If I have this function that take a C and when it's a CX return uh, the value on what it needs not return nothing, I can combine it with a decider that can take CX to create something that when I give it a C and when it's a CX, it will decide the thing. And when it's not, it will just decide nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I have a decider of C as a comment type. Okay. So when, when you have this kind of um, uh, functors are things where you, you in, in, um, in uh, functional programming, so functors is a bit more complicated in uh, uh, category theory, but when you're applying to, to programming, you can see uh, it as um, having a generic type and you have a map operation or select operation that takes a function that change A to B, okay? So you have uh, the typical functor is a list. Uh, you have an operation that change A to B. You have a list of A and you will make a list of B. It's very easy. Just for each element, you pass the element to the list and you get a new list with B, okay? Right? Yeah. It works also for uh, an optional value. You have a value, you pass it to the function, you get the value. You have no, no value, you return no value. And you have a functor on the optional value also, okay? Yeah, makes sense. So uh, you have a functor when you have something that takes an A and you have a function that takes an A and return a B, and it will change a, uh, uh, a structure of A to a structure of B, okay? But here mm -hmm. it's a bit different because we have something that takes uh, B and return an A, we have a structure of E, and it will return a structure of A. So functor is A done B, and you give me a structure of A, and I will return you a structure of B. Okay, this is map. But here we have a B done A, and we have a structure of A, and it will return a structure of B. Oh, how's that? Yeah, because here, here we have something that convert events from the outside to event to the inside. We have something that can take events from the inside and we will, so this will create the structure that is able to take events from the outside, okay? With the other. Yeah. It's actually a contravariant functor and it's called a contramap. Okay? Same thing, just reverse the arrows. Yeah. Okay? So uh, decider is contravariant and C. And so we can define a contra map on C and we can also make it optional uh, this way to make it even more uh, uh, useful, okay? Yeah. The question is now with E, can what, what can we do? Okay, if we look at uh, decide, uh, it takes a C on an S and return a list of E. Oh, a list of E, yes, it would be a functor. If I have something that change E to E prime, E prime, uh, I will be able to change this event to a list of E prime. And so I will have a decider of E prime. Fine, so if I have a function that change E to E prime, I have a functor. 
Great. That would be cool because this way I, I can uh, say, oh, I have this, I output this event, but using this function that uh, change this event to other shape of events. Uh, no, I can say that I have a decider that returns this other shape of events. Cool. But the problem right. is here. Evolve is taking a state on an E and uh, return a state. And now I have a E here, but I have a function that can uh, change E as E prime. Can I use it here? This function takes a E as an input, okay? But to be able to be a E prime decider, I need to take E prime as an input and convert the E prime to E. And this function cannot do it, it's doing the reverse. Okay, what I need here is a function that takes an E prime and convert it to E. And then I will be able to take an E prime event, convert it to E and pass it as an input to the other evolve function. Okay, so actually to make uh, uh, my decider from E and make it become a, a decider for E prime, I need both a, func a function that converts E to E prime to convert the output and also a function that takes an E prime and return an E on the input, okay? Why? Actually, we have, this is covariant, a covariant functor on the output, okay? And this is a contravariant functor on the input. Yeah. Okay? And when you have a functor that is both covariant and contravariant, you have a pro functor. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Not just that, okay? And so we can create a function, an, an operation that is called dmap, which we, the, we will prefix it with E because it will be a dmap on E, okay? And we have a F, which will be uh, E prime to E. And we will have a G that will be E to E prime. So this is unwrapping the value and this is wrapping the value. Right. Okay. And we have a decider, D. And what we can do is that we can say, okay, uh, decide will be uh, of uh, command on state, uh, will be uh, the user decide. Uh, on, on the input, uh, we can keep things the same, but on the list, we will just map it with um, the with J, which will convert our inside event to outside event, okay? On the other side, the evolve uh, is taking a, e, a state on the E, and it will just call evolve with F of E. So we will uh, convert outside event to internal event and pass the state, and it will return the state. Cool. Yeah. So due to this thing, we'll be able to convert a decider of a type of event to another type of event. Here again, instead of doing this, we could put option, okay, to say, if you don't know how to convert an event to my internal format, just give me none. And what we'll, we'll do is here that if we have some E, we'll do that, but if we have none, we'll just return the state. So if it's not an event for me, I just don't change. Yeah, exactly. There's your pub okay. sub. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last thing we have is state. So now we know how to change the common part. We know how to change uh, because it was a contra functor, a contravariant functor. We know how to change the, the event part because it was a pro functor. Okay. And now uh, we want to change the state, okay? So uh, when you look at state, it also appear on the left and on the right, okay? Because uh, in the decide function, it's on the left, comment state on the list of event, and uh, on the evolve, it's both on the left, uh, on the right, okay? Um, on the left, it's not very difficult because if we have a function f that change uh, s prime to s, for instance, s is uh, a structure that contains state for many things, okay? 
And this function f will take in this structure only the part that is interesting to this decider, okay? What we can do here is convert f s prime to s, and here convert s prime to s also, and then we will be able to use it, okay? So here we can just do f of s prime and f of s prime, and it will work, okay? So on the left, it's quite easy. Uh, this is just extracting. The problem is here on the y on the right, we will not have a s prime. We will still have a s. Okay. Yeah. So the thing I can do is that I can say that actually, uh, here we have state in, state in, and here we have state out. And the decider is not a structure that is dependent on three types, but on five types. Yeah. The command which are in events which are in and events which are out, and we could map them on the left and on the right independently, okay? State in and state out. So on state in, this side is a contravariant functor, and we know how to do it. It just takes the functions that take uh, S prime to S, and it, we can take a decider of uh, S and make it a decider on S prime on the input, okay? And what we will do is that we can also make a right map, something that take uh, S, but will return uh, S prime, okay? So let's say that we, we, we return a state and we have a function that can change this state to another state, okay? This is this function we will call F and we can apply this function at the end here, converting this S output to S prime, and then we will have a state uh, S prime on the output. Okay, this is actually not very difficult. The other thing is that the initial state will, by, be, will have to be a S of uh, initial state. Okay, so that we convert the internal state to the external state, okay? So here we have a classic map because it's a functor on the output and we can mm -hmm. use it, okay? The question is then, yes, but the question is when, when we have several states and we want to combine them. So this is where applicative comes uh, into play. So to, to explain it, I will go back to a simpler functor, which is the option, okay? okay. So an option can contain a T and it's either uh, some t or none, right? Mm -hmm. This is obviously a functor because I can write a map function that say if it's some t, it will return some f of t. Mm -hmm. And if it's none, it will return none. And so it will change uh, uh, every time this operation, if you have a function that take an A and return a B, on the left, you will have this that will be an A and on the outside, this will be a B. So you will take an option of A and you will get an option of B. Okay? Yeah. Easy. Now, let's say that I have an option that is sum three. And I have another option, which is sum five. And I have an operation that is add x, y equal, equal x plus y. How do I combine them? I can use an operation which is called map2. Map2 take a text, uh, an, an f function that takes two arguments, okay? And take an option of x and an option of y. And it will say, if I have some x and some y, I will return some f of x and y. In all other cases, I will return none. Okay? Mm -hmm. Easy. So now I have a map and I have a map two. The question is then if I have a function of three argument, I will have to create a map three and a map four and a map five and things like that. Okay? Yeah. Not very convenient. Uh, a thing is that uh, this function, I can rewrite this function add x, x, y. A different way, I can say that it's a function of x 
which is returning a function that takes a y and return x plus y. So the signature of this function is that it takes an integer and it will return a function that takes an integer and return an integer. Yeah. Okay. This is called a currying. Yeah, yeah. So another uh, term for people to look up is currying. It's yeah. probably one of the easier ones to understand from everything that we've said so far. So for instance, add three is a function that takes a y and return a three plus y. Yeah. Okay. What happens? So if I look at it here, add is actually a function of one argument. Okay. So I can use it with map because map is taking a function that takes an integer, uh, for instance, uh, an integer and will return a B. What will be B in my case with add? It will be a function that takes an integer and return an integer. So mm -hmm. if I have some three and I map it with add, what do I get? What is doing? What is map doing? It's so it's seeing that it will we have some three, so it will call add with three. Okay, so and it will wrap it in sum. So what I will get, I will get sum, and I will get a function that takes a y and returns three, three plus y. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So if if I had none, what would be the result? The result would be none. So if I had a value uh, on the left, the result is a partially applied function with this value that expects the next thing, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I have nothing, I, I get nothing, of course, okay? Yep. So now, let's say that I take this sum three, uh, the result of this, okay? And I get the y, but the y is also an option. So I get sum y three plus yeah, and sum five. Mm -hmm. What I can do is I can say, okay, I will do a map to here with these two values. This thing will be the first parameter to the to my function that takes two parameters. So we will call it f. Yeah. Okay. So the thing inside here will be the first thing that will be passed to the map two, okay? This thing will be passed here. So I have uh, y, but uh, with this, it's five, okay? Mm -hmm. and what we will return, we have a function of type y and we have a function that take, can take y. What do we do? We just pass this value. What, what uh, happens here? It say, okay, I have a function that takes y and return three plus y, and actually y is five. So it will be three plus five. So the result will be some eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when the thing is that when you have a map two for any structure, you can take here, uh, 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 I will call it f of a, give b, b, so here it can be a list of, or an option of, or a decider of, okay? Okay. And I take a f of uh, a, like that. Here, this will go to the first parameter and we will call it f. This will yeah. go to the other parameter and we will call it uh, x. And what we will do is just that we will pass x to the function and we will get the result. And this right. result will be the result f b, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's very convenient because we have a way to, to take a partially applied function and uh, combine them. So now let's say I have a decider on command uh, event state in and state out x. I have a decider. So I have a way to, to take this several deciders and combine them, uh, make them with the same input title on the left. 
the same event type and the same um, uh, input type for the state, but for now the output type is still different. Okay. Mm -hmm. This way, uh, with uh, the. Uh, the thing is that if I have a function that take uh, S O X and a S O Y and a S O Z and return a S. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can see it as a function of one parameter. So I can map it with the first one and I will get a decider of C, E, S, I, and something that if you provide me a state for the rest and a state for this also, I will return me a state. Okay, mm -hmm. but this thing already contains the state for x. It's embedded inside the function as a partially applied thing. Okay. Yeah. And now uh, this is because I use map on this function on that. No, I have this, and I have a decider of type uh, with the type this. So what I can do is I can do map map to or apply. Okay. Yeah. Using this and the decider. Uh, X and the result will be a decider of C, E, the state on the input, and something that take an output state of type uh, S and this. And I do again the same thing, apply, and I will get a decider of C, E, S input, and S. Yeah. And now this decider uh, in the end, uh, if here my state in was S, has the same uh, input state and the same output state, okay? Yeah. And so it enables me to take an arbitrary number of, um, of uh, decider and combine them as a whole. So I show the code here because uh, I know I've written a lot of things, but the, the way it looks, so here I have my decider and it's, uh, as you can see, I have five types, generic. Okay, so this side is taking a command and an input state and will return an output event list. It takes an input state and an input event and will return an output state. The initial state is an output state and the is terminal is taking an input state and will return a bool. A decider with only three types is a decider where the two event type and the two state uh, types are the same. Okay. Uh, here, this is just each of the function I showed. So this is a right map on the state. This is a, a next to last uh, function I, I showed. This is a map to on the output state. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a apply which which says that on the left we have a decider that contains a state as a function on a, um, another decider, and we mm -hmm. extract the result and pass the this one to the other one. So you've seen the schema. Yeah. Uh, this is a map on the right for the event. This is a map of the, on the left for the commands. This is a map on the left for the events. This is the D map for events. Uh, this is a map of on the left for state. Yeah. This is the two map. And then I just uh, use a computation expression in F sharp to build a computation expression that um, uh, enables me to write the applicative part. So the the part where you get the different part and then using um, uh, bind on apply, you will be able to combine them in a single function, okay? Right. This is just a way to map this function to kind of keywords in uh, F sharp. And so the, the, the way then you combine them is this one. I can uh, say that, uh, so I have a global command, which is either a game command, an and command, or a stockpile command. I have my events that are either a game event, an and event, or a stockpile event, okay? Mm -hmm. Here I have my command, my function that says, if it's a game command, so I, re I return it, or I return none. If it's an end command, I return it, or I return none, and all things like that, okay? And for yeah. the event, I have the mapping in both ways. So if it's a player, if it's a game event, uh, I return it or not, and give me a game event, and I will return you an event. Okay, same thing for the other one. Yeah. 
And then my uh, state is just uh, the game state and the map of all player state and the stockpile state, okay? And now I can take my decider. So as you can see, my game decider is taking a command, uh, a game command, a game event, yeah. and a game state, okay? I map it on the left for the comments with uh, things that can uh, extract the command for the game. I demap it on events uh, with the function that extract and rebuild uh, events for the game. Yeah. And I left map on the state by extracting the state of the game from the structure, okay? Yeah. And what, what I will get here is the state for the game, okay? Here, I do the same thing for ends. I take the uh, undecider. I lift it to map so that now it will take an identity, a player ID for each part and the state will be a map. Mm -hmm. Okay. I map it on the left for comments. I demap it for events so that now it can accept events from the more global uh, event type. Yeah. And I yeah. left map it on state to extract the state for the ends. Okay. And what I get? is a map of player to end state, okay? Mm -hmm. And the last part is for the decider. I take my decider for stockpile, I map it on the left, I demap it on event, and I left map it uh, on the state. And here I get a stockpile state, okay? Mm -hmm. So this let end end is actually using uh, the, the right side uh, state uh, map and map two. Okay, mm -hmm. and then when I take this value and return the build state that combine everything, it will use this apply and uh, map to and map function to actually combine them to build the result. Okay. Yeah. In the same settings that what I showed uh, before. So what I get here is that I get a decider that can take comments and return events and have a state for all those things as a single thing. Now, imagine that this is able to run one game, but if I want to run multiple games, what can I do? I can just take this thing and apply to map. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm able to run multiple games uh, here. I don't have to change the domain code for this. Uh, my functions are still the same. I just combine them using standard operators. That's okay? right. So now I have this for deciders, but I can do the same for processes. So I have a setup process and the pro setup, I have a, a drawing process that, so the setup process is doing uh, things like uh, when the game is about to start and the player around the table, it will uh, shuffle the, the stockpile, draw a card for each player, draw the first card, put it on the table, the game starts, okay? So this is a setup that is able to listen to uh, all those uh, that will uh, send comments to each part, listen to for events to schedule the next thing, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the shape I showed before. Uh, the drawing uh, process is uh, listening when cards are drawn for a player, it will put it in their end, okay? The mm -hmm. picking uh, process, when a player picks the card from the end, it should end on the game uh, pile. Uh, passing yep. is when a player is passing his turn, uh, they, should, um, they should take one card. Uh, the taking back is when you have made a mistake, you have to take your card back in the, your hand. And the penalty is when you make a mistake, you have to take two extra cards. Mm -hmm. And stopping is that when the game is over, we want everything to be marked as uh, being uh, done. Okay? Right, right, right. And so each process is um, do, done uh, independently especially when drawing or picking, I created a process for a single card, not right. for all the cards of all the player, but I can, using exactly the same technique, I can leave this process to a process for all picking cards. Yeah. Okay. Even if there are several in parallel, no problem. And uh, this is process event. This is either a setup event or a drawing event with the player and all that, or a picking event with uh, the player and all that, all that, all that, and the stopping event. Uh, these are the things to extract and all that. And I create exactly the same thing 
to create a process manager that is actually uh, just combining all the process together. So right. this thing is capable of taking action result or map event on the left and uh, outputting uh, uh, comments as a result and uh, list also of events that will enable us to track the current state of all this process. If um, you don't have to save the output events if your input uh, action result are already ordered. Uh, if it's not the case, save the output events in a stream and then you will be able to keep the, the, the order, okay? Mm -hmm. For views, it's exactly the same. I can have my state for each views, okay? I have events that are targeted for each views. I have my functions that can extract them. And then uh, I can just, in the same way, combine them here by taking each individual views and combining them in the in a big view that contains the state for all views. Okay. So in the end, I have three things. One decider, one process manager, and one view. Okay. And I yep. just have to find how to, to combine them. So it's very easy. Uh, what I do is here. Uh, uh, when the player uh, inputs some uh, text, I parse it as a command. So it can be either a query, in which case I will fetch the state from the views, okay? Or it can be a command. And in this case, I just have to mm -hmm. pass it to the decider and the resulting events to the processes. So this is an under command uh, thing. And uh, this thing is doing that. So it takes mm -hmm. a decider on the command and uh, it takes the state for the deciders. Okay, and it, I, it will output some events. It's a decider, so I give it a state on the command and it return, return the list of events, okay? Yeah. Now, what I can do is that uh, I can do a fold on these events, passing them to the process, processes, okay? But the processes at the same time will uh, fold their state to maintain their set, but also return a list of uh, comments, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I do is that I, I uh, at the same time, compute the next step, take the, the list of the commands and concatenate them together. Uh, this is what the collect fold is doing. So on each step, you return a list of things on the new state. The new state will be used as the state for the next uh, iteration. And the result will be the concatenation of all the lists, okay? So what I do is I, I ingest the events on uh, the, 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 the output events and I re get a list of internal events. And I also collect for them with the uh, evolve to be able to get a new state and then calling the pending react uh, function, I get a list of commands. I concatenate all the commands together and in the end I'll get the list of commands and the final state of all the processes, okay? Yeah. So my new state for this whole system is folding my decider with the events to get the new state for all the decider, folding with the events, uh, all my views to get the new state of all my views and take mm -hmm. the process state as a process state, okay? I have a list of commands. I can just call myself recursively with that list of command to process this command, output new events that will uh, get new, uh, new commands that will process new events. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it will not make progress anymore because uh, everything will be in a state where we have to wait for more uh, users input to continue. And so this will re return the final state of the thing. Right. Okay. So this function is returning the final state of all the deciders, all the views, and all the process as a single object. And so uh, what I do is that I take this state, I check if it's the final state. If it's the final state, I just end the process. And if it's not, I just call myself waiting for the next command, okay? Mm -hmm. The thing here is that I model all the part of the system as being independent using the same signature. Okay, yep. and then I used uh, uh, I used uh, operators to combine them 
to as a bigger structure that has the same signature. So mm -hmm. running something that has this signature, there are multiple ways to do it, but whatever what's inside, it's always the same way. Okay. So uh, here I have one and I can just run it this way and it will work. If I want to save and load and things like that, that would be really easy, easy. I could just take the state, save everything. And when I start again, I reload everything, do the thing, save and once again, or I could save all the events in an event store. And when I start, I fold everything and all that. I, I can choose, okay? Yeah. But also, if I want to split everything in actors distributed over the world, I can still take exactly the same model Instead of uh, combining them with the operators, I will use um, the messaging between uh, actors to do the thing. But the model will stay exactly the same. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's amazing how, um, how declarative um, everything is in terms of if you know exactly what the rules are, um, yeah. it's, it's quite simple to, to compose. And when you see the simplicity of the loop and just how you've deconstructed everything. Yeah. Yeah, and so this, this, this is where here, here I have this, uh, almost the same thing, but where uh, every thing is a mutable state in memory that will be updated, but this is exactly the same uh, mod, uh, domain, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, this uh, version, uh, each part is independent and is loaded and saved in a Mongo database on each call, okay? Yeah. And it, this one, uh, each part is independent with a, 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 an asynchronous uh, loop that is expecting a, 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 a commands from a queue and will follow the things and uh, save to the event store. And when you restart, it will follow the thing. But my domain is exactly the same in all cases. Okay. And each time the infrastructure code is just that, I mean. This is the infrastructure code to run it in the event store. This is uh, the infrastructure code. This one is a bit longer because there is a lot of uh, SQL and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but this is the one for uh, running it and saving it from state. And uh, this is the one for running everything in memory synchronously. And this is the one to run everything in, uh, in memory, but keeping each state separate and putting a kind of stream or bus uh, between the parts. Right. And I, I can put everything in a single uh, thing and I don't even need really a framework to do this because uh, for instance, the applicative code is just, uh, no, not this one for, for uh, the decider. Yeah, Jonathan uh, is asking uh, if the code will be available. Line of code, so. Sorry. <laughs> what? There was a question from um, Jonathan yeah. online. Uh, he's asking if the code is going to be available at some point. Uh, yes, not now, uh, now because it will be part of the book I'm working on. So, um, ah, I, part of the book. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this will be the book that explain all that. So uh, the, the idea of the book uh, for now is to uh, first uh, explain how we go from the, the classic architecture to this uh, mm -hmm. distilled patterns, okay, these distilled signatures and why. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then there is all the modeling which is uh, when you have a, a real world problem or oh, you make it fit your real world problem is the signatures. Yeah. So it takes elements from event modeling and domain driven design and all that and uh, mm -hmm. functional programming and uh, things like that to, to, to get to models that can be run. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is a question uh, of uh, combining things, mm -hmm. okay? Like I showed so that you can decide your boundaries, your you, you have uh, logical and physical boundaries that becomes more independent. Yeah. You see? Yeah, no, they're, uh, they're, they're really clearly explained. And I, that example is quite clear how um, I think a lot of people were, were struggling with the process managers, the sagas, and the yeah. pub sub in terms of always having a different answer from you know everywhere you look. So yeah. this is really yeah. distilling down 
uh, you know, gluing together separate state machines exactly. uh, yes. with more, yeah. uh, you know, functional paradigms. And, and, yeah, uh, and, and after that, of course, um, depending on the, the functional, functional level of your language, uh, you can apply directly or you can just get inspired by the way it works. I, I, I mean, if you have a, a, a language where uh, functors are, are a thing or applicative are a thing, you, you can do it like that. If it's not the case, maybe you will do it manually, but you know that uh, it will be, it should be equivalent to this pattern, okay? Uh, and then the, the, the third part is that once you have a domain that is written as a decider and uh, as a process managers and views, yeah. uh, how you, now you have things that just have a signature. So we don't care about the actual domain you wrote because as long as it has a signature, you will be able to run it the same way, okay? So yeah. the second part will be about runtime. The runtime will be a ways to to run these parts together, okay? Uh, so uh, do you save and lose state, uh, keep state in memory? Uh, how you recover from a hard crash? Uh, uh, saving uh, events, uh, rebuilding from events, uh, migration, all that, okay? Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to run these things. So yes. we'll explore them. Uh, but we, we get things from event sourcing or not, or not event sourcing, or you can just uh, fold uh, when you have a migration, for instance. So you save state each time, but when you have a big change on your data structure, mm -hmm. uh, you just rebuild them from all the events and replace the old structure with a new one. But yeah. On a, on a runtime basis, you will just reload the last version each time and it will work, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is simpler sometimes that reloading from an event store or something. So you can use the list of events just for operation. Uh, uh, and the next thing is uh, operations. So how do you manage uh, zero downtime deployments? How you manage uh, evolution over time? Uh, how you manage when you had a hard bug in, a, in an event store? stream and you have to recover and things like that. So uh, when, when you have a system that uh, lives a long life, uh, that it should be up uh, most of the time, uh, mm -hmm. how you manage the art part. So it will be probably more uh, prescript prescriptive, but less uh, formal. OK, but right. I think people need, need that. And there will also be a, a part which will be more abstract about uh, the link uh, of these two functors and uh, all the isomorphism we, uh, you have. So uh, how you can map um, a finite state machine to this. And uh, um, so the more abstract things are of uh, what is the scope of this and how it works related to the outside from a mathematical uh, point of view. So. Right. Uh, I think it will be interesting to uh, better understand the, the structure of all this and the option you have. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be less useful uh, operationally on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you get into some limits in what you can do, uh, you feel that you are on the limit, it should give you tools to be able to find your own solutions. Yeah. Well, that's great. We have more questions about the book because that really um, yeah. got people's attention. So first of all, what do you have a title for the book? Uh, functional event sourcing. Sure. Functional event sourcing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> people on well, YouTube are asking. My, my technical, uh, no, yes. <laughs> and, uh, functional in a, in a dual uh, sense that uh, it's uh, functional as in functions and uh, yeah. functional as it works. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Both sense of the word. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. And uh, I think you've captured some other things, such as uh, making sure that these uh, streams don't live forever, um, yeah. which is covered under tombstoning, the... which is really important for, for running these you know systems for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And uh, the other thing is that, for instance, I, I make sure that uh, when you have a process and it crash, uh, you can retry operations. Uh, you don't have operations that disappear in the process. OK? Yeah. Uh, uh, but but still, what, what things things I will say um, I will advise in the book is that 
for instance, you know that in the event store, you can do uh, uh, optimistic concurrency by giving the version number and thing like that. That's right, yeah. Okay. So it's very convenient to have a consistent system. Uh, but of course, uh, implementing it is just, it's not very difficult, but it's a bit more difficult than not doing it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> very easy once you get the thing, but uh, doing it is still a bit more work than not doing it, okay? And the thing is that uh, people are living with systems that don't do it anyway for decades. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so uh, my first advice will be, if you don't have the problem, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And if you have the problem, then it's easy to actually solve it. And That's this right. is the same thing for all the rest. If you have a, a concurrency problem, you will be able to do that. And uh, the first technique can be to reload everything when you have a concurrency exception, but the other option can be to reload only the new events from where you were. And uh, then you can uh, do things like uh, from this new state, try the new co the command that you was just given to see if it still makes sense mm -hmm. or compare this command to what happened just before to see if we have to reject it or rebase it or anything like that. So you can increment the, the, the complexity of all that, but this is things that people uh, will never think about in the system they wrote before. So yeah. if you come up front and say, you will be, you, you will be able to manage a concurrent operation uh, uh, in a consistent way all the time with distribution, with high availability and all that. Mm -hmm. Of course, the complexity of running a system like that is a bit higher than mm -hmm. a system where everything is synchronous and where you don't check versions. Yeah, okay. I think what you're doing is really giving structure to what was really missing in requirements as we made systems digital. Uh, yeah. And and I, I think there's a lot of, uh, just because everything became run on computers, it dehumanized the process of organizations. And now yeah. there's a natural way to find this back. So I certainly yeah. find a, a better yeah. way to represent what non-functional requirements are in something that is more functional from the business yeah. perspective. Yeah. They're just not like, oh, just make this work and make sure these concurrency issues never, you know, never happen. And yeah. that everything is up to date to every, you know, millisecond <laughs> for everything. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is that um, uh, this is the, the, the problem with the uh, with, uh, usual um, uh, way to present event sourcing is that event sourcing has always, uh, people who went to event sourcing uh, did it because all the rest failed. Yeah, okay. that's right. <laughs> so, uh, the, the usual uh, method of writing application uh, was not an option for you. And mm -hmm. at some point, uh, this, capability, this capability of uh, uh, distribution, of isolation, of um, uh, being able to, to detect uh, conflicts and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, managing their, them uh, in a good way uh, was the only option for you, OK? Yeah. So the thing is that uh, when, when we talk about event sourcing, usually we start with this and saying, yeah, this way you can have eventual consistency, but without the risk of uh, concurrent, uh, concurrency uh, problems and all that. And this is great. And this is really easier than doing it another way because the other way is just failing. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, but then people think, oh, I don't have this problem. So I don't need event sourcing. Yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> exactly. Of course, the, 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 this is not, uh, when, when you do event sourcing, you can distribute everything in a far simpler way, but a distributed system is still far more complicated than a non-distributed system. Yeah, exactly. Okay? Oh, there's event sourcing uh, without distributing the system. <laughs> yeah, you can <laughs> do, traceability. Uh, or, or even you can get the structure, but load and save. Yeah. This is exactly what people do. But the thing is that the structure of your domain is already, already uh, ready to change the infrastructure code to all those things I was talking about. Just exactly. you don't now uh, into effect, but uh, the cool part is that in doing so, you will have to change nothing to your domain code. Exactly, your 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 actual state transition remains. Exactly, because yeah. due to the structure, you can run this code in many different ways without changing it. Okay. Exactly. Well, we have a couple more questions from people. So yep. is this on LeanPub and how can we get updates on the book? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, actually, the book was requested by uh, Eric Evans. 
Okay. So I have to check with him uh, our publishing uh, options. Uh, okay. Because maybe we can find an editor because uh, maybe if, if uh, I manage to do it uh, correctly, uh, this is something that could be publishable uh, yeah. in a good uh, editor. So, so that's big I, news. I didn't know that the book was a, a request from Eric himself. So <clears throat> this is really good came, to see. He came, uh, he came to see me in Paris uh, to ask me to write it, actually. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, um, it, it's nice yeah. to see um, coming from the person that invented domain-driven design to yeah. for that person to demand um, event sourcing be published <laughs> to support yeah, yeah, sure. domain-driven design itself yeah. really um, book ends the whole journey of domain driven design over the last 15 years yeah i, I think so and uh, I, I, this is why also i think it's important to 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 get the whole picture not uh, actually only the uh, uh, saving events uh, in streams part yes uh, exactly because, uh, this is more more than that actually yeah and the way you decompose it at the different levels of combining the deciders gives you the right uh, boundaries for the type of thinking you need to do if you're going to do event yeah. sourcing or not, or if you're just going to yeah. be functional about your domain state, yeah, which exactly. is really wonderful and missing yeah. from, from the literature. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that is uh, the thing I found on the way, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, I started to write it, and by trying to explain and refining my models and things like that, I, I stumbled on, on this uh, yeah. really that we were... Um, in a way, even not uh, uh, researched. I mean, people right. were not, uh, looking for this. I, I, I would say I stumbled on it. I yeah. didn't expect, and it just popped up. And so now I have to, to talk That's about right. it. And uh, I have the same problem because I stumbled on event modeling, and I thought I was doing event sourcing. <laughs> and I yeah. said, well, I have to write about it because it's different, and it has this, you know, this focus on state and time yeah. and by example and all this kind of stuff. And so... The same way I never went, I never looked for that, but it just jumped out at me. <laughs> same yeah, like you have these uh, wonderful abstractions that I think carry that pure pure state um, management. Of course, F sharp yeah. and functional and, pair functional languages are excellent for demonstrating this. Yeah. And, and uh, I think in a domain driven design, uh, it was important to to go from no modeling to to finding the boundaries and things like that. But here, the, the good thing is that it gave the shape to the actual program. The, exactly, and uh, of course, the, you can so translate it's, uh, this really like actionable. Yeah, and yeah, you can take this and implement it in any language because you can implement yeah. you know functional paradigms. Yeah. In other languages, so we already started with some C sharp code. Um, to show the different examples of how you would do, you know, like something like a yeah. for each or mapping. Yeah. Um, left folds, uh, all those things are supported um, uh, as concepts. What I showed here is, uh, is doable, maybe only the, the, the applicative part because you have no curing in uh, C sharp. So That's maybe right. you, will, you will use uh, something like map two, map three, map four, map five, map Yeah, six, you'd have to expand it, exactly. Up, it should be okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll take it as far as your domain will need to go and take yeah. it. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. I think it would just be measured by how many um, deciders you have to link, right? The, yeah. the no, number, no, right? No, no, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm actually uh, uh, saying something that is not right because I already uh, managed to distort a link queue uh, from in uh, syntax to write applicatives. So actually, oh, okay. Can... So you can do currying with a link, no? No, uh, you cannot do currying. No, you can't because you have to carry uh, the. You can uh, distort yeah. the monad into an applicative uh, using the from in select syntax. Ah, uh, okay. So what you would do is from uh, my game state in uh, my game decider, right. uh, from my player's state in my player's decider. Uh, select uh, the combination of both, and you will have an applicative. The way to write it with select many is uh, totally uh, like uh, you will pull your hair. Uh, but uh, but uh, once you get the right signature, it will just work like that. So it's a bit difficult to write the, the select many thing. But once you get it right, it's very easy to use. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, I guess some languages are a little bit uh, more cumbersome. But when I think once you do it for your 
I'm just worried about the number of compositions that you're going to have to do of deciders in a language like C sharp that it might actually just get a little bit too nasty yeah. and different, right? Yes, yes. In the, in this case, maybe just compose compose them by creating uh, things that will call uh, based on the type. So you will do the dispatch manually. Yeah, I think that's like what did, it would be. Like I did with the case with two deciders, on where I do everything for the two deciders in yeah. one, one round. So you can just create a, a kind of uh, uh, other decider class mm -hmm. where you say if it's for this command and all that, and then you use the yeah. other deciders, and then you will do. But the, this function, this class should just do the composition of the smaller parts. And exactly. Just for, for this reason, and it should be okay. Yeah, and and I guess this is the difference. Like this is one of those things that was harder to uh, get across from talking about sagas and process managers and how to yeah. write you know, specifications for them, because again, you didn't have uh, the opinion of a language. So that's why, you know, it, it was easy to just say, well, that's just a to-do list. We're just going to use yeah. that because it's a generic way of talking about the state that you're talking about, that S variable for for the the, the things that compose your deciders. Yeah. And, and here, uh, then you have this uh, uh, pending function that takes a state and will output uh, uh, actions to, to do, okay? So yeah, exactly, which is your, your to-do list. <laughs> and, uh, yes, this is your to-do list, so yes, yeah. that's uh, yeah. easier. Yeah, um, well, I guess we'll open that up to more questions. Um, there was, uh, okay, so we answered the last ones here about uh, the book. So the book obviously is going to be um, highly anticipated. I, I hope that um, you have time to add um, the comparison between C sharp and other languages, maybe just uh, where yeah, where the where the advantage of a functional programming language yeah. lies, and then yeah. what you're giving up if you're switching to something else. Yeah, exactly. But oh, the the idea is more about the yeah you 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 I, I will talk about the different things like uh, mutation is a premature optimization and thing like that. But right. you can see it as a kind of uh, Shortcut. Uh, shortcut, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Laziness. And I will explain <laughs> cases where you really want no mutation uh, because I already had some cases like that. And yeah. yeah. So for what if what if scenarios and things like that, there are a lot of uh, very interesting things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, we have we still have about uh, we've been on for two hours, over two hours, which is great. This yeah. is a very good, yeah. very thorough. A look at what the book is going to be about and how you can bring domain knowledge from the business directly to your code, um, yeah. and to make it uh, you know one and the same, which is really good with a real example, some some you know a game that has some eventual consistency things. We talked yeah. about it before in terms of yeah. how do you know when all the cards have been dealt and uh, all those things. There's some yeah. async you know asynchronous components of this, so it's not a trivial example of a chess game or something. It, no, no, has, no, no, no. it has the timing issues and all and, these things. Are just... and, uh, and with the rule of uh, interruption, you can have concurrency too, like mm -hmm. players trying to play at the same time cards as fast as possible. So uh, this is the kind of pattern you have in a classic enterprise. Uh, yes, uh, line of business uh, applications. Yeah, yeah. automating uh, insurance companies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Uh, so I want to open it up a little bit to questions if there's any from the people that stuck around in the meet in the zoom yeah. um we have uh, just a handful left after like i said we went on for quite a bit but this was really really good because i think you covered from top to bottom every single abstraction down from the very you know event and yeah. initial command for a specific you know one uh, one component of the whole system such as a deck of cards being shuffled yeah all the way through to what someone holds in their hand uh, and upwards to the entire overall state of, yeah, of the game. So for one um, game or many games. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's see, there's uh, Jonathan's here, a few others that I see. Um, if they can type their questions or ask, they can unmute their um, microphones. Please go ahead and ask if, if there are no questions. I think you were very thorough. Um, and uh, as, in, as probably indicated, people see the value of this and just want to get the book to be able to study, um, uh, study the ideas in, uh, at, their, at their leisure to understand each part. And then, of course, to 
uh, go through the, the, the code examples yeah. and be able to dissect, uh, play with uh, the code, implement their own uh, examples. You know, maybe they want to do a, uh, you know, a to-do list application or their, their own game or some, some other project that, that, they're, that they're working on to, to do it yeah. this way. So, yeah, I don't think, uh, oh, there, Jonathan is asking a question. So we do have one question. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for people to gather the courage to ask something. <laughs> uh, go yeah, ahead, Jonathan. I can, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I figure I'd, I'm, I'm usually the talkative one if I'm here, so I'll jump in. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to, I wanted to like, just, just clarify for my own thoughts, like my big takeaway from this, if that's okay, which is, I, I think what you're saying is like, this is a, functional style architecture that we can apply to any event sourced application, I think is what, yeah, what, or what any, you're saying. I would say any stateful, effectful system. <laughs> so like any, any system. <laughs> Pretty much because you don't have to do event sourcing to do this, right? There is the state yeah transitions that are, you can, you that can are explicit. Save, uh, save and load state, so you don't even have to even source it. Yeah, but but I mean, I think all of us here, at least for our takeaways, I think we're all generally pro event sourcing, and so kind of. But 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 either way, yeah, I, totally. That's great. I uh, think it's um, I think it's really important to have uh, both because then it's an easy bridge. Yeah. Right. Um, so you can have one system that's uh, event sourced and one system that's not, but both of them are doing their. Uh, both systems are yeah, doing uh, a very good job to keep the state uh, accurate. I, I understand. Yeah, I think, yeah. So to, to, to just restate exactly what you guys just said, it's the power of this is that it, it models itself well to any type of infrastructure modeling. Like it is, it is a, a real decoupling of the infrastructure layer, yeah. um, yes. even down to what a vast difference a traditional database model and an event source model yeah. actually are. Yeah. I, I, wow. I, have a, I have an implementation where uh, the state is actually saved in uh, rows in the SQL database. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. we have one more question. Uh, I know that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I didn't know you're not finished. But we have one more. We have one more uh, person that wants to unmute. Edgar, are you there? Yes. Uh, oh, can Edgar. you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, well, uh, amazing uh, conference. I I really gather much of it. I'm not a pro at event sourcing. Yeah. Um, I've tried to figure it out on my own, and I'm happy that um, I'm somehow kind of kind of uh, stumble uh, in, yeah. in in things close to to the one show today. Um, yeah. And I have uh, two questions that come. Um, uh, in my own journey on functional yeah. programming and event sourcing here. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is the combinators, in, specifically in F Sharp. I felt yeah. like there's some things that I, I kind of couldn't do and often found examples in other languages like Haskell yeah. or Scala. And, yes. I, and, and I wish to know if that's also something that you guys like experience, like, or you think that F -sharp can completely express everything um, that you have needed to accomplish your modeling and your event sourcing uh, issues. I, I know, of course, that um, any any language we can do anything in any language, yeah. like like it was uh, um, said before, yeah. like you can do anything in in C sharp. But yeah. I, I would you know how how's your struggle on, on that matter. I, I, I think that uh, uh, of course you could uh, uh, implement a decider or a process manager as I showed uh, in Haskell using type classes, uh, which would be quite convenient. Uh, uh, the, the thing is that uh, choosing F sharp um, is also because uh, F sharp is a bit less um, uh, functional. So, uh, the, the syntax will be easier to write and to, to follow for people who don't know the language than um, uh, some other languages like Haskell or be, where, where more magic things happen in the back. Uh, 
uh, and at the same time, uh, in F-sharp, I can uh, easily also fall back to mutation and things like that to show still with the same language how you would do in an imperative or, or object um, uh, model. Um, so uh, it's functional enough to, to, to model the things that you would do in uh, Haskell without going full type classes and things like that, but you can still have the same kind of structure and use them. And uh, at the same time, you can also uh, give a good uh, overview of how to make things simpler that, than some of the, of the functional uh, structures that sometimes are more complicated than um, for, I mean, for the domain using a very functional code is very useful. Uh, for the infrastructure, uh, it will mutate and all that anyway. So sometimes it's better to just go with it. So uh, I try to be pragmatic and each time I, uh, I try to show both version, one which is more functional, one which is less but still convenient and thing like that. So that it's simple for everybody to, to, to get your, your own sweet spot based on the language and the infrastructure and your, your maturity with uh, functional uh, languages. Something like that. So okay. Yeah. F sharp is a, I think, a sweet spot uh, for that. Okay, that's that's great. Yeah, I think so much because that uh, 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 kind of uh, reassure that the effort learning F sharp is worth on the long term. Yeah, their yeah. uh, functional yeah. languages aren't the same. All of them aren't the same. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, there's, there's a. Oh, sorry. I I think uh, F sharp is quite easy to to the, the code uh, there is a few operators to or, or just uh, um, uh, symbols to 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 know but after that um, uh, it's not cluttered with things like types and things like that uh, everywhere so the syntax is light uh, like what you get in python uh, but it's uh, totally typed, so when you know don't know what a thing is, you just have to to pass your uh, pointer over it, and you will get the signature. And each time you don't have something that fits, the compiler will explain to you that it's not the right combination of things. So uh, it's safe, but not non-intrusive. Okay. And when when you when it's easier to do a mutation than doing uh, functional, uh, just write the mutation. It's okay if it's safe enough for you. Just go for it. So this is a language language where where you can do that. Just uh, all the defaults and the idioms are more specific to functional, but you can still do whatever you can do in C sharp with F sharp. And I and I think there's a, a really interesting article too on F on like the reasons for going with F sharp from a guy who's developing a language actually called Darklang and he was yeah. he he originally started developing it in OCaml uh, yeah. and just talked about evaluating Rust and F sharp and of course you know he yeah. already was evaluating OCaml implicitly and just why F sharp was the right choice for him in the end which. Yeah, and in, in F Sharp, you can use any .NET library for JSON parsing or uh, connecting to any database or all that. And it's uh, exactly the same that you would do in C Sharp. So you have a lot of tooling around the language for interacting with all the hot stuff uh, you will need today. So, uh, and it will be easy to find documentation for these libraries and all that. So yeah, I think it's a, a sweet, a good spot between uh, uh, functional and uh, still usable in everyday setting. Yeah. So we have a couple more things here. So Twitter handle is think before coding. So Jeremy is on Twitter, um, think, but then it's the letter B and then the number four, coding. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I always forget the number four. So whenever I tell yeah, someone uh, like that. where to yeah. find Jeremy, yeah. I always have to look on my own Twitter. But now I committed it to memory because we've been in contact quite often. <laughs> so now I have it committed to memory. So think think before coding. So B4 yes. yeah. is the acronym with the number four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. actually, uh, on uh, GitHub and all that, uh, this is uh, before uh, written, uh, spelled uh, correctly, but on Twitter, it was too long, so... Yeah, it's 15, uh, 15 character limit on Twitter, so uh, you need the... <laughs> so, uh, GitHub, 
think before coding the full words. Yeah. And on on Twitter, think the letter B, the number four, coding. So people that are listening, they can remember that. Yeah, I have a lot of sample uh, on my uh, GitHub uh, uh, with uh, functional event sourcing code. So it will not be as complete as the one I'm showing for the book because um, there is a well, I made a lot of progress uh, recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's difficult to to also have a lot of code without having the explanation with that. So uh, mm -hmm. I prefer to reserve the code with the explanation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good, good, uh, giving code like that. Uh, because there are many ways to run it. So uh, in a single uh, uh, application, you will have only one. So if you don't have the full process of how you evolve it and all that, yeah, you, you cannot get everything. Yeah. So there's one more thing. I think we already touched this from David. Question is, uh, do you think the composability of deciders uh, helps limit domain leakage where events from our one domain or part of a domain is used by another? Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 one, one thing you, you, you can do uh, first is that actually you could fuse your, your, your implementation of a decider Okay, to try to see if a command is the output of a command is dependent on other events. Okay, so uh, you could uh, uh, pass commands and return events and then test the same command on any combination of output events and see if sometimes the output of the command change based on the state. Uh, if it's not the case, uh, this command can be handled in another decider. Yeah. So I, I like to make sure that that leakage is, um, is explicit, like so that you don't have those uh, certain information available to other ones without having a transformation. I think a lot yeah. of the, the work in that area is, um, is kind of expressed as public schema events versus private schema events where you yeah, use yeah, yeah. one yeah, to yeah. communicate to another and, and one to use state. Uh, the, the event type is local to each decider. Right. Okay. So I define the event type inside the decider uh, module uh, so that uh, if you are in another decider and want to use an event, you will have to import the other module. So it will be visible that you are crossing the, the thing. Okay, so uh, you, you, there is you, you don't create a big list of all the events for everything. You will create small modules with only the event uh, or the commands uh, relevant to a single decider. And then if you want to make a bigger decider, it will just be the combination of all the common uh, types together, but mm -hmm. you will keep the structure. So there is no way that we will mix things. Yeah, this was a really good question, and I think the answer is yeah, uh, quite easily in this case because you the the scope of where the definition is is so clear to see yeah. here. So yeah, yeah, that can be a problem uh, if you're not explicit because you know you end up in sort of the the heat of the the moment, not taking the time to either aggregate the events that you want to be public out mm -hmm. to. Uh, you know, because some part of it is of interest to other parts of the domain, but but much of it is really just internal plumbing yeah. only for that. Uh, hmm. uh, of course, on the on the outside of the domain, so communication with what what I call events is uh, is the events for persistence. Okay, but then if you, for instance, the events don't go directly to to uh, processes. These events are converted to processes input format so that the processes can ingest them. Okay, first. So there is a combination here. Of course, if you publish your event on the outside, uh, this is an API, so you will have to get some kind of uh, uh, layer between both to convert uh, input things to output things. Uh, you can uh, either do things like uh, filter out some of the events that are not relevant to the outside or uh, filter some information that you don't uh, want to output 
or you can also enrich events with a view of the state uh, so that the, from the outside, you can just take the value without having to listen to everything to rebuild the state and all that. So there are a lot of patterns like that that are very interesting also. Uh, but no, here events are just for the decider internally. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Thank you, David, for that question. Really good. Um, I think we had the, almost everyone ask the question that for the, who is remaining, but we're way over time, and I think it's really late um, in yeah. France. Yeah, it will uh, be. <laughs> and I think uh, Jeremy would probably like to start his weekend, his visiting yeah, his brother, it, right? It, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, thank you so much for for dedicating your time. Uh, we learned a lot. Um, it's thank you for uh, hosting uh, this uh, awesome uh, meetup. Yeah, no, no problem. It's uh, it's the least I can do for for helping people to learn. But I think it was a real treat to basically get you know more or less the entire book that you're writing um, in in this time to really go through the core ideas, the right mm -hmm. levels of abstraction, uh, you know the 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 importance of immutability for correctness to have something that is well structured and again to me you know really important concepts are those seams so that your domain doesn't leak out so that you have uh, an easier way to write tests for, for being able yeah. to, you know, these pure functions are incredibly easy to test. So all the things about testability, um, you know, you'll, you'll gain from that. And so I certainly can't wait for the book. As soon as it's out, um, I am going to buy it. <laughs> I suggest everyone else that's interested in writing more, um, uh, you know, robust systems that don't have uh, errors uh, map really easily to what your business is doing. Uh, definitely go get the book as soon as it's out. I'm not even going to ask you when because uh, I don't want to put pressure on you. <laughs> yeah, the problem is that uh, I increase the scope as I find new things. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. I know the feeling. <laughs> so, um, and thank you also for, for you know, um, relating everything to, you know, what uh, what we did in event modeling, that it's useful to you. I thank, thank you for incorporating some of those things. I'm really happy that Eric has reached out uh, to you to do this because, I think there was a long journey uh, alongside event sourcing with Eric Evans along yeah. the way. And uh, this is a really good bookend to all of that learning for the last 15 years. If you start the history with Eric Evans' blue book, and yeah. now you put the, I think it'll be a very big milestone to have, uh, you know, functional event sourcing at the end. Because I, I, yeah. my personal opinion is that event sourcing um, this really good way of looking at state really helped domain-driven design and its adoption through Greg's work mm -hmm. and others that have been, been doing this yourself, of course, and many others um, yeah. that gathered in and around to to show the world how much uh, more, uh, you know, how much better the systems are when they're when they're used this way. So thank you again. I can't say enough about the amount of time you spent <laughs> explaining everything, and I hope that everyone uses this episode to, you know, go through it and slow down look at the code, uh, study what you draw, especially, you know, all of the definitions of each decider. I think that's a very, very good explanation for how you compose that and logically uh, move those abstractions through to the next level higher. Uh, it was really a uh, thorough, thorough explanation that I think didn't miss anything. Uh, so thank you again. I can't, I'm really excited about doing this with you. <laughs> I, I can't wait for the next one. What else, you, what else are you going to find for us? So, <laughs> Adam, I, I have a question for you. Uh, sure. This is the first time I've joined your meetup because I mm -hmm. was actually in a conference all night with uh, that the Jeremy had, had been at and he, he said he was going to be here. Yeah. And uh, it's great. I, I really appreciate it. But uh, I see your recording. So is this going to be available to? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, this I, think is, uh, this I need is, to I need yeah, to the, do on this a lot. And, yeah, uh, you can. So we're streaming live on YouTube. We always do twice, uh, twice a week, uh, believe it or not, Mondays and wow. Fridays. And uh, and everything's live on YouTube and all the recordings are on YouTube. So I used to have to edit them and I, it was a lot of work to edit them. So I'm just publishing them as, uh, as the recordings in their raw format, trying to be a lot better as a broadcaster uh, in my, how, I, how I speak. But you can, yeah, you can find them. It's uh, yeah, event-driven uh, information systems 
uh, meetup. Uh, so there's, if you search YouTube for, for event modeling or event driven, that will generally get you to those channels. There is a podcast version of this on Mondays. So it's more less visual. It's more about being uh, interviews with people about, uh, about the concepts. So on the Friday ones, like the one you're watching now, it's a lot of screen sharing where you can show uh, all the concepts uh, Jeremy is uh, drawing and explaining, which is really, really helpful. So that's that's more of a meetup where we can interact together as we're doing right now. Um, for for the podcast on Mondays, it's really about interviews. There's still some que question and answer from the audience. We still have a Zoom call for it, um, but it's meant to be more of a, of a podcast form where people that are just listening can also learn and they don't have to rely on visuals. So we're trying to, we're trying to to do two formats to really make something available for for people that are interested in one or the other. Um, so yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah. And if you have people that are you know that are interested, uh, send them a link to it, and uh, hopefully they'll they'll learn from uh, from this really thorough explanation of uh, uh, of functional programming applied to yeah. event sourcing. And and uh, to 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 uh, give uh, I I don't know where where uh, it will uh, lead me but uh, i i took contact with uh, thomas petricek uh -huh. uh, with the uh, uh, f sharp um, uh, uh, f sharper who worked with uh, don syme oh okay uh, i know don syme language uh, on the language design and the implementation and all that and uh, mm -hmm. i told him about these structures because he made some mathematics about around uh, those kind of functional programming Mm -hmm. And um, I also tried to to take contact with uh, Bartos uh, Bartos uh, Milevsky, yeah, uh, which was a uh, category theory for programmers to see what uh, if if ex everything I I was talking about is uh, sound, or also if there are other structures that I didn't see, but uh, that uh, someone who is more knowledgeable in uh, category theory uh, can mm -hmm. spot and uh, get an even better composition so maybe maybe in the following week uh, i will yeah let, let me know if uh, if you think if you can uh, gather them i would love to have uh, you know have everyone on on uh, on the meetup and i think yeah, for, i, I will try to 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 contact uh, these people yeah i i at some point i i need uh, some help from people who know more math than me <laughs> <laughs> well I it's very mathematical so if, uh, you've given a good base if you know it's yeah, it's really good if you can understand it then that's really good and uh, you know i think it'll be yeah. It's very logical, so I don't see why that wouldn't, you know, be a good yeah. basis for the next steps. Uh, yeah, but yeah, but the 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 the, the thing is that uh, sometimes the concept already exists in mathematics, just yes. not been applied yet, or yes. <laughs> or they are applied in a totally different uh, context where we didn't see we we were never in contact with. So uh, sometimes the connections are really interesting. For uh, already today. Uh, uh, Thomas gave me pointers to a term that I never heard before and which is in relation with something I wrote uh, almost 10 years ago about monoidal <laughs> sourcing. And uh, yeah, so, so this gives new new clues and maybe new insight in, uh, in the coming. Okay. Uh, well, that would be that would be a really good follow up. I mean, from a mathematical perspective, if we can have one or two people that have a good math background, uh, that's going to be really exciting just to have a, a more solid base for this understanding so that uh, yeah. people can make this choice knowing that uh, you know how much rigor has been put to it so that yeah. their so that their systems can be stable and dependable for instance one one of the pattern I'm trying to find is uh, is there a kind of unit decider mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the best candidate for now is a constant decider which says that it can text any event or any command and as a any state, uh, but the thing is that the decide function will always return an empty list, and the evolve function will ret always return the the input state. That's right. And the initial state is one value of mm -hmm. this state. Okay. Yeah. So for instance, and if you, if you have it and you can use it as a construction by combining it with the rest to build bigger decider, yeah. you can get new insight or thing like that. So. Uh, and I can't wait to update uh, some event modeling blog post on mapping um, 
your decider and, and, and evolution functions to just show them where they sit um, when you have an event model. So someone that's just looking at screenshots over time with some events, yeah. they can see exactly where this implementation is going to yeah, be. The, the idea is that uh, after that, you can, you can just take the, your event modeling and uh, just uh, take it and implement it using the pattern. And yeah, exactly. then you can decide how you run it. Yeah. That's still the next step. And that's, that's really exciting. Yeah, it is. I, I can't wait. I think this year is going to be very, very good for um, event sourcing and uh, everything around domain-driven design and, yeah. and these concepts. Event modeling is really taking off as well, more than I yeah. had hoped. So it's all it's all really shaping up to be a much better year than last year. <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that gave me, really, event modeling gave me a lot of insight about how to to, to uh, especially when, when you decided to, to, to remove uh, the state from the model, uh, but like when you you have your uh, state evolution, uh, state uh, I don't remember the, the name, state change. Yeah, state you change. Uh, yeah, you have a list of events, a command, and you have uh, some events, but there is no state in this. Yeah. And the fact yeah. that uh, both uh, formula uh, formulation are isomorphic, you yes. can uh, always go from one to the other or uh, or the other direction automatically. Yeah, I mean that they are actually the same thing. Just one is a detail, but that can always be introduced or removed based on what you want to do. It's kind of a, yeah. So that was the goal. Solid results, <laughs> yeah. solid results for, for for thinking. Well, thank so, you. That's good. I'm I'm happy that it's helping. Um, you know, get these concepts across and and make better better systems. So I think at this point it's uh, two and a half hours in. Um, yeah. We'll follow up and see if we can get the mathematicians in the room and really add some interesting concepts. And uh, maybe we'll uh, put, we'll dare to put the math hashtag into the tweet and see how many mathematicians show up for the next meetup. So <laughs> that'll be exciting because I'm definitely out of my comfort zone. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we since we have functors and pro functors and things like that, category theory things, but also more general things like. Uh, uh, group state monoid uh, um, uh, uh, semi rings and all that are mm -hmm. uh, interesting concepts in the in the field. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, have a wonderful uh, evening and the rest of the weekend, mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy. I hope to hope you stay yeah. healthy and everyone uh, stay safe out there. And yeah. we'll be back on Monday with an exciting episode. Still a secret who's going to be on it, but look out for the podcast on uh, on Monday and then the meetup on Friday as usual. So. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and 